So just assuming that all the eigenvalues are between two things does not tell me there's always a vector I can add that will go forwards. Uh, let me show you why. So there are two problems. On the low side, imagine I have many eigenvalues that are all clumped together. You know that when you add a rank one matrix, they're going to interlace. So one of them can't go past the next. So if there are many eigenvalues that are clumped together and they're near the low barrier, there's nothing you can add that will push the lowest one too far. On the other hand, with the upper barrier, well, yeah, I guess one problem is if you have a bunch of eigenvalues near the upper barrier, the largest eigenvalue sort of gets repelled by all of them and goes, can go shooting off. And you just have a problem also. If you, if you add any vector with a large inner product with the larger eigenvalues, your largest one goes shooting off, the others sort of stay nearby. Okay, so we needed a stronger inductive hypothesis. Here's what we came up with. Um, we came up with what we called a potential function that will measure how close the eigenvalues are to the barriers. So the first one I call phi sub L, we call the lower barrier, poten barrier potential function. It's the sum of the reciprocals of the distances of the eigenvalues from the lower barrier. So I sum 1 over lambda i, the eigenvalue should lie out here, minus the barrier. So this is powerful if I can bound this number. So for example, if I know the barrier is at most 1, I know that the smallest eigenvalue is at least L plus 1, where L is my barrier, but I know more than that. For example, I also know that there are no two, if I know this is at most 1, I know there are no two eigenvalues within distance 2 of the barrier, no three eigenvalues within distance 3, and so on. So when I put an upper bound on this barrier function of 1, it's really giving me control over how close the eigenvalues are to the barrier. It also has this very nice expression. You can write it as the trace of A minus, the inverse of A minus L times the identity. Okay, I just want to be completely honest here. We did not just come up with this. I mean, you know, we wrote a list of about 10 different reasonable things we could possibly use to do this and went through all of them and only one of them worked. I don't want anyone to think that, you know, we were just sitting down and said, ah, oh, yes, this is the answer. You know, it, math, at least for me, never goes like that. Breaking a time honored tradition of speaking about it. <laughs> yes, I am. I absolutely am. Oh, this is proof I say we can do. I mean, it's amazing. Once we had this expression, actually, there were still many weeks of analysis of this and others, but this one has an incredibly simple proof that it works. I, I think I have seven minutes left, and I still plan on showing you the proof. Okay, let me just point out we also had an upper barrier potential function, same thing. Sum the reciprocals of one over the distance to things from the upper barrier, but it's less than it. <clears throat> And now this is after the way our proof works. So just take a look at the beginning. Our upper barrier at n is the sum of 1 over the distances of the eigenvalues from n, which is 1, because all of them start out at 0. So in the, and the lower barrier is also initially at 1. So both of these barrier functions at the initial barrier point start out at 1. And what we need to do is we need to show you that at every step, Wherever the vectors are, given this potential function, there is always a vector I can add so that when I move the barriers forward, the, bar the values of the barrier function stay less than 1. But actually, I just have to be very careful. I'm not just adding a vector. I'm adding a vector times a scale parameter. And this scale parameter, which we thought was completely unnecessary, turns out to be what allows our proof to go. And so our ideal proof is we keep doing that, we get to n and 13n, and that's going to be our 2.6n approximation with 6n vectors. Okay, so now as I said, I just want to show you a little bit of the proof in about five minutes, and then I'll finish the talk. But I can sketch, I think, everything. So again, our goal is to show we can always choose some multiple of one of our vectors, given that those vectors are decomposition of the identity. So when I move the barriers forward, these barrier potential functions do not increase, given that they were at most 1. So here's the way we look at it. So let's look at the upper barrier update. I need to understand what this is. We can use formulas for how the inverse of a matrix updates when you add a vector, like the sherman morrison formula, to understand exactly what the new barrier function will be. It's just a few lines of math. And what we get is the condition we need is we need, okay, this is our new barrier function at the new value. Let's not worry about what it is. We just need it not to increase. 
Mathematically, when you rearrange terms, it turns into an expression like this. It says you can add s times a vector v and move the barrier forward by 2 to u prime. That's the new location. If and only if this expression is less than 1. The important thing about this expression is that v and s only appear on the outside here. So this is a quadratic form, just some matrix there. And s and v are on the outside. So we actually call this the upper barrier quadratic form. And we just need that 1 is less than or equal, 1 is at least s times v transpose uav. And a similar thing happens for the lower barrier. But the lower barrier goes the other way. We want something to be at least 1. Because you know, with the lower barrier, you're trying to add more vectors to push the eigenvalues forward so you could advance that lower barrier. The upper barrier, you don't want to add too much, so it's got an upper bound. And the question was, we just needed to show that we could add some multiple of a vector so that 1 would always lay between, lie between the lower quadratic form and the upper quadratic form. This is what we needed to do. Okay, so here's what we know. Because the vectors were decompositions of the identity, we knew that in expectation, the upper barrier quadratic form is always at most 1. And in expectation, the lower barrier quadratic form is always at least 1. And we were very happy there. We were ready to proclaim victory. Because this means that there is a vector, VE, so this is less than 1. And there's a vector, VE, so that's greater than 1. But they don't have to be the same vector. And expectations don't give you anything better than that. So what do you do? Well, this is where the scale parameter came in. What we realized was at least the upper barrier quadratic form was lower than the lower barrier quadratic form. So there is a vector v. So the upper barrier quadratic form is less than the lower barrier quadratic form. Find that vector. Once you have that, and that they're both positive, which one of them has to be, then you can find an s that you multiply that puts 1 between these two numbers. So that was the key element of the proof. Sorry, I'll show you the other element in the next minute. But it was just how do you deal with these two expectations? This is where our scale parameter came from. One thing is less than another, and then you get a scale. You can multiply that puts it between both of them. Is this what your attempts didn't satisfy? Um, the other thing is actually a lot of our attempts were to try to make one function that would measure the global quantity rather than having these two. And yeah, and we couldn't do things like this. And yeah, it was very, and just getting anything you can analyze. It's, it's a miracle when you can analyze anything is actually my belief. So that's how it came. But okay, let me just tell you how we bounded the expectations. This is again amazingly simple. So I told you those expectations were 1, I think, or greater than 1. So let's look at the upper barrier quadratic form. So the first thing to do is a quadratic form you can rewrite as a trace of a matrix times the outer product of the vector. You, some of you remember if you have traces, you can cyclically multi shift around how the matrices are done. So you can write this as a trace times an outer product of a vector with itself, which means that in expectation, we get the expectation of a trace, but the ex expectation and trace commute because trace is linear. So we get the expectation of the upper barrier quadratic form times the expectation of the outer product of our vectors. Well those are a decomposition of the identity. Oops, I dropped a 1 over m here, I'm sorry. Should have had a sum there. Anyway, you basically get that the expected value of this upper barrier quadratic form is just the trace of that upper barrier matrix. And then we were lucky again. The trace of that matrix has an incredibly clean expression. I'll just show it to you. You know, I, I, I ran through the expression before, but now let me show you what it was. This was the upper barrier quadratic form in trace. Okay, the term on the right is incredibly simple. This is the value of the upper barrier quadratic form with the old matrix at the new barrier. As the, bar the new barrier moves forward, so this is actually lower than the value of the bar potential function at the original barrier. So this term is at most 1. When we look at the other expression, it turns out that the numerator is the derivative of the denominator function. So this denominator, if you treat it as a function in u and you take the derivative, you get the numerator. So then you use, what is this? This function is uh, convex and decreasing in u prime. And then that just sort of immediately shows, because u prime is 2 greater than u, this term was at most a half.
And so literally, it, okay, I probably said it a little bit simply, but you know that if you sat down for five minutes, you could follow this. The analysis is this simple of the upper barrier quadratic form. And the lower barrier quadratic form is the exact same analysis. For the parameters 6 and 13, I put in, you can get that it's 2. And so all we really needed was that the trace of the upper barrier quadratic form was less than the trace of the lower barrier, and we'll get that because 3 halves is less than 2. And that's the way the end of the proof goes. Okay, so let me quickly stop with some open questions. So this gives us what we call twice Ramanujan sparsifiers. Um, we get in the end, after adding dn steps, we get the ratio of the largest eigenvalue to the smallest is at most this term, which again is at most the ratio of the corresponding roots of associated Laguerre polynomials. Which actually means to me, I, I don't expect to do better than this for general matrices and matrix approximation problems. So my guess is that to get to the Ramanujan bound, you probably need to use something special about graphs, which we have not used at all. You know, we just turned graphs into sets of vectors, and then this was just linear algebra. Okay, here are some open questions for you quickly. Um, if you apply this sort of concept to the complete graph, what's very strange is we do get sparsifiers of it, but we have weights on the edges. Is there any natural greedy algorithm like this that would approximate the complete graph and sparsify it, but without weights on the edges? That's something we'd really like to get. And if you could come up with that, again, you probably have to use something about graphs. Maybe you can get to the Ramanujan bound. Maybe you can also understand what is special in this argument. We are using some sort of, there's some special properties of the vectors you get from graphs. I know one thing that comes up, which is low stretch spanning trees. You can also characterize algebraically. And the algebraic characterization of those, it relates to traces of these inverse Laplacians, doesn't happen for arbitrary vector sets. It's something special about graphs. Another natural question is, can you get a faster algorithm? Like, there are really simple ways of getting a fast algorithm to approximate the complete graph. Just take a union of random Hamiltonian cycles, a constant number of those, that's a good expander. Is there anything like that that works for sparsifying? We have no idea. I really hope something does. Because people would like fast, good algorithms for sparsifying. I mean, I know we've got that n log n in there, but the people who actually want them, want them without the log n. Um, and finally, let me mention that these other questions I was asking about unweighted sparsifiers are really a very big problem in disguise. So Gil Kalai pointed out to me this very annoying thing that what we've done here is some, said something that's very, very close to the Caddis and Singer conjecture. This is a 60-year-old conjecture that came up in mathematical physics and has reappeared at least in five or six different places since. Basically, I told her that when we did random sampling, that worked really well. We sampled with propo proportional to the norm of these vectors. But what if all those vectors had the same norm? Well, if all those vectors had the same norm, then we would think that we could build our sparsifiers by choosing all of the weights to be the same with entries in 0 and 1. If you could prove that, you would have established this Caddis and Singer conjecture. Basically, you just need to get rid of the weights in the special case when we don't think we need them. And what's also very provocative is Rudelson's theorem tells us that if I sampled order n log n of the vectors rather than order n, which we need, then you don't need the weights in this case. Then you sample them with 0, 1. So there are these two statements that are very close. If you can get n log n vectors, Rudelson's theorem tells you you can choose the weights in 0, 1. To prove Caddis and Singer, we need to get order n, but then our proof throws on the weights. So one would love to get rid of these weights. Um, I've been working on this for a while. I would love it if someone else would solve this problem and put me out of my misery. And I'll stop there. Thanks. <laughs> yes. So we have implemented it, but mind you, this is about an end of the fourth algorithm. So we haven't. Okay, so the end of the fourth is because you, you, you try all the v's until you get one. You try all the v's, and at every single step, you need to update your inverses. So we do. We can do that by a rank one update. Yeah. But still, it's about quadratic time per update. Yeah. Then it's a loop of n steps per. So we haven't done this for more than 30 vertices. Yeah, okay. So I, I don't know what we can conclude from it other than that, yes, it in fact does seem to work. But um, the, so I will tell you, I have 
implemented a large number of different heuristics for trying to get good sparsifiers. And you know, anytime an undergrad says to me, ask if they can do a project with me, I'm like, yes, here's another heuristic, implement it and see if it works. And unfortunately, all of the heuristics which are fast, we break. So we don't have anything I'm happy with yet. Uh, but I'm still hoping that there is one. Uh, let me put it this way. If you have an application where you have a lot of graphs that sort of look similar, then I'm an optimist that one of the heuristics we know will probably work for you for most of that application. But that said, you know, I, I can break it. Any heuristic I know I can break right now. Yes, so yeah. Uh, maybe you said it and I missed it. Uh -huh. Is there any combinatorial interpretation of these vectors? Uh, I don't know a great combinatorial interpretation of them. We, we got to them through two changes of variables, which makes it harder to understand exactly what's going on. Yeah? Are you aware of any stability results? Let's say you take the graph and you mm -hmm. start off and you perturb, let's say, the weights. Uh -huh. What would happen to the sparse part? Oh, that, okay. So there are two things. One, if you just perturb the weights a little bit, that is an approximation of the original. So small perturbations of the weight sort of preserve approximation. So we could get sparse of ours, but another question is what would happen to this algorithm? I have very little idea. So th during the course of this algorithm, and we have chased it out you know, very carefully to try to get at the Caddis and Singer conjecture, what, you know, it can alter one step during the course of the algorithm. And once you've altered one step during the course of the algorithm, it can follow a very different trajectory later. Yes. Uh, can you get any work on approximating linear programs, large linear programs by small? Um, I have not. There are people who have. When your number of vector, sorry, when your number, you can do it when one dimension is much larger than the other. Like if your number of constraints is much larger than the dimension, say by a fact, if your number of constraints is at least the dimension times its log. Then you can, let's see, so I've seen two things on this. One was a paper by Michael Mahoney and I forget, I think Petros Dronaeus and I forget who else. No, they did that for overconstrained least squares. I think they did some optimization. You can also do this inside an interior point method if you want. So if you actually look, though I don't know if anyone's written it up yet, but if you look at what an interior point method is doing um, at every single step in solving the optimization problem, it's basically solving a least squares problem. And you can apply sort of Rudelson type sparsification, random sampling. There it's actually efficient, because there we know the norms of all of the vectors that we have in everything. And what you get will be approximately good enough for the next step in interior points. So yeah, there's some work going this way. I think there's, there's a lot more to be done. How about network flow problems in a special case? Okay, so for network flow, okay, so this was in some technology with some sense, the sparsification of Banks or Carger was to some degree originally developed for the purpose of, say, maximum flow. And you can show that you can apply those sparsifiers and then serve, solve maximum flow in the approximate problem. And then David Carger wrote another paper showing how you can leverage that to get good solutions to the original problem as well. If you do multi-commodity flow with sort of irregular, multi, then I'm, something like it should work. I'm not sure exactly what the details are. There is a paper under submission that I've seen using this sort of technology to speed up actually the solves of multi-commodity flow problems. But in that, I believe it's in the internals rather than just saying here's an approximation of it. But certainly it's a good question and there's more to do there, definitely. Yes? Can you say something about, like, you already said this doesn't work for directed graphs, but you say more about it? Like okay, so, okay, with directed graphs, here's a problem. Um, the question is what we want to approximate when we sparsify. There are many, in some sense, with undirected graphs, we get symmetric matrices, and then there are many notions which can be defined differently, but all turn out to be the same, like singular values and eigenvectors. And so with directed graphs, all these notions split. And I... There's most notions we've tried to come up with sparsification, the notions are false, we just can't do it. There's one or two left that I like that I really don't understand. Um, the way I get at them is I go by looking at the linear algebra again. And now we're not gonna get eigenvalue, well now you, know, you don't necessarily get diagonal matrices or anything like that, 
But it turns out there's still a notion from preconditioning that you can get by looking at the inverse of one matrix times another. And what you then care about is where the eigenvalues lie in the complex plane. And I think there's a reasonable notion here you could use. But again, it, it's a little bit messier because you actually need to understand not just the eigenvalues, but the eigenvalues under small perturbations and where they can live, which is called the pseudospectra. And you know, for some problems, those, they jump around a lot. So I, I think there are things to do. But in some sense, in the undirected case, for many applications, the answer was the same. Whereas in the directed case, different notions are going to be different, and it'll really depend on your application. Well, thank you again. Thanks. Here's the reception with food, which you're all invited to. You can ask Dan more questions as well. And uh, Dan's in the Bay Area.